Good morning. Good morning. Great to be worshiping with you today and to be asked to be your speaker. It's interesting. I don't necessarily feel like a guest. Um, like you mentioned, I have the opportunity to worship with you guys on a fairly regular basis because I come here quite often um, to visit the in-laws. Joe and I lived together for a couple years in college and we both realized we would rather have female roommates and so we married sisters. <laughs> um, and that hasn't turned out too bad. <laughs> um, today I want to talk to you guys about this topic of scars. And the title for today is The Beauty in Scars, which might seem a little incongruent. I mean, beauty, scars, that doesn't add up. So one of the things I'm hoping to do over the course of this message is maybe unpackage that and make a little more sense of what I mean by that. Um, the scars are interesting things. I think we can pretty much all admit that we have scars. Um, scars from maybe work injuries, scars from sporting events, uh, maybe from wiping out on a Harley, or maybe a Schwinn, depending. Um, the thing about scars is that the telling and the retelling of stories always gets more grand and more elaborate every time we talk about them with other people. Um, you'll have a guy who is trying to impress someone and say, I got this scar when I went overseas on this dangerous secret co-op covert mission, when in reality, he probably fell on his son's sk Spider-Man skateboard and hit his head on his daughter's rainbow bright playset. Um, scars are never as grand as we make them out to be. And I got several scars all over the place. I got one that's finally fading on my leg from touching a hot motorcycle muffler. As a child, I've got several from some surgeries. Um, I got one on my right hand from cutting it open on a piece of metal working on the farm. I've got another one on this thumb from cutting it open on a hook blade when shingling. I even managed to get one on the back of my hand, getting books out of my locker in high school. <laughs> but I think the thing is, is that for as much as we sometimes brag about having scars, we also have scars that we try to hide. Scars that we had no control over getting. Um, scars that we're ashamed of. Maybe they got happen. They happen just because of choices we made. I know personally, I've had several scars. That when it comes to time around the campfire to whip out the war stories about scars, there's a couple I have that I tend to skip over. In fact, I think we all have scars we tend to skip over. In 2011, I want you to catch this statistic: Americans in 2011 spent over 10 billion dollars in plastic surgery. On top of that, we spent an additional 8 billion dollars on cosmetics. We go to great lengths to cover up scars, to hide them and make them go away. Scars tend to be visual reminders of stuff that have happened in our lives. Um, scars aren't fun to get, they hurt. They take time to heal. And they tend to be permanent reminders of tough situations. But I think as, as much as physical scars hurt and as much as they're on the outside where we can see, I think we also carry with us a bunch of emotional scars. And I think these scars are much worse. They run much, much deeper, and they tend to cause us much, much more pain. They cause us to believe that we're tainted, that um, <clears throat> we fall short, that we're unlovable, that we're not good enough. In high school, I used to play football. Um, and to be honest, I was, I was pretty good at it. When you place your face mask in the short blades of a quarterback, and you feel the air rushing out of his lungs as you drive him to the ground, there's no better feeling in the world. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. That's the greatest feeling in the world. Um, I know there's an uncanny resemblance there, but that's not me. <laughs> uh, but I was good at football. Um, as a senior, we went undefeated, won the state championship. Uh, made all conference, all states. Um, played for the South Dakota All-Star game as a senior. Um, I held or even share several records for defensive stats, like sacks in the game, sacks in the season, all that stuff. And at the end of my senior, I even had a, couple, a little interest from several colleges to play ball for them. But if you ask me what some of my main memories are from playing football, one of the first ones that comes to mind is standing in the cafeteria prior to a football game. And one of the other players saying, hey, Waltner, when's the last time you've seen your toes? I was 205 pounds and built. So the message wasn't congruent with what was reality, but it hit home. And a scar was left. 
And so was it any reason to doubt that when my coach came to me, when I was sitting in front of a computer one day and said, hey, would you be interested in playing ball for SDSU Brookings? I said, no. And walked away from high school ball because I didn't think I had what it took. And there's going to come a point in time, I'll get to that a little bit here. And that's why I picked this text today out of Psalm 51 and also Luke chapter 7. Because we have a, a story that shows a woman's interaction with Jesus, a woman who has her own set of scars. And a Pharisee who's pretending that he doesn't have any. That he's perfect, that he's got nothing to cover up. And I think we're all familiar with situations like that, where we, sit, we come across someone who says, oh, I don't have any skeletons, I don't have anything to hide, I've done nothing that I regret. Or maybe we think that about someone. Oh, look at that person, they are such the ideal Christian. If I just had a life like them, things would be good. And if this happens, or maybe I should say when this happens, I hope you guys are all wearing a pair of boots. Because you're going to be standing in this good state. Because you know what? It's a lie. It's not true. We all have scars. We all have stuff that we wish we could go back and, and do differently. Things we could say differently. I'll probably have to hand in my man card for admitting this before I leave today. But. <laughs> I have seen the movie The Princess Bride several times. Oh, this is the worst. I enjoy it. It's a good movie. But there's a scene in that movie, for those who have seen it, where Wesley, the guy who walks home, as you wish, very romantic, is disguised as the dread pirate Robert. And he sort of kidnaps his love of his life, I guess. But as he's disguised as the dread pirate Robert, they're having a conversation. And one of the things he says to her is, life is pain. Anyone who tells you differently is trying to sell you something. Life is pain. Things happen to us. We're born into sin. We have scars from sin. We have things that happen to us over situations that we can't control or maybe that we choose not to. Scars from, that we get from yelling at our kids and seeing the look on their face simply because we've had a bad day. Scars from maybe cheating someone out of money or maybe finding comfort in food when things get tough, from drinking too much, maybe having a long night, waking up feeling used and cheap. Maybe we get scars from resorting to looking at pornography instead of our wives. And we have dots that we desperately try to get rid of. We get scars from abuse, from being made fun of, from being ridiculed, for not fitting in. In the end, from turning to worldly solutions and feeling farther and farther from God. So as we look at this account in Luke chapter 7, we see that we come across a woman with scars. In verse 37 it says, she was known to the people of the town as a sinner. Now we don't exactly know what her sin was. Maybe she was a prostitute, perhaps an alcoholic, maybe simply a rebellious spirit who had too much pride to make amends. But she's got scars and she's been labeled. And we get labels and we label others. I currently stay at home and raise kids, but prior to that, I used to work in construction. And one of the things we loved to do is in, our, in my job, one of the areas we like sort of excelled at was building kitchen cabinets. And one of the products we used to build kitchen cabinets was called MDF. Now typically, your drawers, fronts, and your doors are made out of solid wood. The box itself in the cabinet is made out of MDF, which stands for medium density fiberboard. So they take wood particles and add a bunch of wax and resin, and then under heat and pressure, turn them into these panels. The thing about MDF is that it's cheap, it's light, and it's durable. It's also extremely ugly. Um, so what they do is they take a very thin layer of veneer, any type of hardwood you want, oak, cherry, mahogany, doesn't matter, and they put it over this MDF. Now you've got a gorgeous looking piece of wood. You have to be careful with it, because this veneer is thin. On one particular job, we had a client that was extremely fussy and attention detailed. And, um, he had a cabinet similar to this where the end was going to be exposed, and so we had to have a nice looking piece of wood. We picked out one that the gratings were consistent, it looked excellent. And as I was sanding it, getting it ready for staining, guess what happened? I managed to sand it all the way through that mirror. Needless to say, the sander and I never got to be good friends. Um, but I had a gracious boss. But now we had a cabinet that can't be used because the veneer 
had been sanded through and exposed the MDF underneath. And that's what we do. We put on facades of our own. We put on our own veneers to cover up the insides. We walk around being worried. Worried how, how long is it going to be before someone sees through our veneer. Before they see the ugliness underneath that we're trying to cover up. And sometimes the problem that happens is what the life God desires for us doesn't line up at all with where we are and how that leaves us feeling. There's another movie that came out in the mid-90s called With Honors. Follows a Harvard graduate who has several pages of his thesis stolen by a homeless man. And the homeless man is only going to give back a page or two at a time based on favors. Like, uh, give me a couple of glazed donuts, I'll give you a page or two. Give me a place, warm place to stay. This Harvard graduate has a roommate named Jeffrey who is constantly butting heads with this homeless man, Simon Wilder. <coughs> And things come to a head at one point in time, and Simon Walter says to Jeffrey, you know why you hate me so much? Because I look exactly how you feel. We try so hard to hide our filth, our inadequacies, our failures, our scars, just like that, that we end up focusing on others. We focus on their shortcomings, we give them dots. We become the spec police, and we miss the plank. And I wonder if that's part of what the Pharisees' problem is in this, in this text in Luke chapter 7. Is there's a woman in front of him who's full of dots, full of scars, and almost to the point where she doesn't even try to hide it anymore. She's known as a sinner already. And it drives this Pharisee nuts. And he calls, just like Jesus, just like Jeffrey in that movie, he's, he sort of calls Jesus out, oh, this man, we're a prophet. He's, you'd know who's touching him. You'd know who this, this woman is. She's a sinner. He was so focused on her outward behaviors that he misses her heart. Mm -hmm. And Jesus' comment to Simon, he says, Woman, Simon, do you see this woman? The Greek word behind the word see is, is more than just simply a visual perception. It's more than a Simon, do you see this woman standing here? It also references, do you see where her heart is? In a couple chapters down from here in Luke chapter 18, Jesus tells a parable about another Pharisee with a tax collector where they come to the synagogue and this tax collector, but this Pharisee stands all loud and proud and God, thank you that I'm not like this man over here, this tax collector. <coughs> Meanwhile, the, Pharisee, the tax collector falls to his ground and says, God, I'm a sinner. Not even worthy to look at you. And the same situation is so focused on our behaviors that they miss where their heart was. Well, the hypocrisy of it all is that the Pharisee's heart was in the exact same boat as this woman's past behaviors. He just tends to hide it behind legalistic righteousness. And at the same time, he needs her to have dots. Because that's the only way our facades work. The only, when, we, when we go around trying to make ourselves look better, we need other people to look worse than us. That's the purpose of facade, is to be look good. But I'll be honest, keeping Scott the score is tiring making sure that so-and-so is worse than us, that we, that we stay on top of our game. And this woman was tired too. She was tired of her scars, tired of not being enough, tired of being labeled, tired of the veneer. I think it's easy to think of her thousands of years ago and sort of, ah, uh, she's different. But I want you for a second to try to put yourself in this woman's shoes and imagine what it was like to be her. Then she comes into her house in the morning after a night on the town, a night of work, whatever. And you discover that Jesus is in town. You've heard about this Jesus. And you desperately want to be healed. You desperately want to be made new. So you decide, I'm going to go see this man. You stand in front of the mirror and look at yourself and you can't stand to see him. This is nothing of the life you imagined as a carefree child. But you decide it's now or never. So you reach down and grab your alabaster flask of perfume and you head out the door. It's not too far from your house. And you can tell when you're getting close because there's all kinds of people milling about outside. You make your way into the entrance despite the, the glares, despite the snickering of those around you. And you enter the house 
You see Jesus off on the other side, reclining at the table. And you start making your way to him. And as you walk in this room, you realize the room has gone quiet. People have stopped eating. People have stopped talking. They're staring at you. You can hear the occasional snicker. Oh, she's a sinner. What's she doing? Before you know it, you're standing at the feet of Jesus. And all you can do is burst into tears crying. You fall down at his feet. And in, a, in an act that is most one of hospitality as well as reverent awe, you start wiping his feet with your hair. Feet that have already been moistened with your tears. And Jesus starts talking. And as you look up through your tear-filled eyes, looking at him, you realize he's addressing the Pharisee, but he's still staring right at you. And you can see the love and the compassion in his eyes. This was not the life that God had for her. It's not the, the life that he wanted. He had something more in mind for her. And this woman had a repentant heart. And so Jesus tells a parable to this Pharisee, <coughs> emphasizing the fact that nothing she has done is too much for me. That for as much as she sins, I love her that much more. And the only response that she can have is to love me back that much more. It doesn't matter how many times we've sinned or we keep returning to the same sin. It doesn't matter how far we feel that we've fallen from God. Like the prodigal son, he returned to God. He welcomes us with open arms. Because for as far as the east is from the west, that's how far our sins have been removed. Where our sin increased, his grace increases all the more. All we need to have is faith and believe in him. And he welcomes us back. Now earlier I talked about this construction, MDF, the veneer. Another type of wood we worked with was the, uh, the hardwood or the solid wood. It's pure wood all the way through. One particular job we did was a couple that was remodeling the turn of the century home. And for a guy who digs old school houses and literally this place was amazing. They had a fireplace in the house that they wanted a fireplace around for. And this woman managed to find one in her parents' attic that had been originally built for her grandparents. And so they wanted to refurbish it. But it was covered with paint and lacquer and old finish and dusty. And, and so I spent days and days and days sitting on a stool in the shop, armed with toothpicks and toothbrushes and remover and all kinds of stuff, trying to make this thing look nice. To the point where I'd stand up and I'd look like Quasimodo from the Hunchback of Notre Dame because I was stooped over working on this thing. But when we got to the point where we got all that paint removed, all the dust taken off, this fireplace around was beautiful. Nicks, gouges, scratches and all. And the thing of it is, is, for as beautiful as that fireplace around was when it was originally built, those scars, those scratches, those gouges, made it even more beautiful. Because it adds to the story. And spiritually, there's a greater story going on as well that involves scars. This is the first Sunday of Lent, if I'm not mistaken. Time where we look at Jesus. And just like that fireplace was perfect and ended up taking on scars and nicks due to something that's stuff going on around it, so Jesus did the same thing. Perfect man who took on our scars, our nicks, our gouges. For those of you who are familiar with uh, Isaiah chapter 53 and the verses leading up to it, it says, His referring to Jesus. Appearance was so marred, beyond human semblance, his form beyond that of the children of mankind. Goes on to say, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And with his wounds, we are healed. For those of you who have seen the movie The Passion of Christ, you know what that means. You know the extent of the beatings, the whippings, the torture that he endured. It was painful and horrific. It was meant for us. But we don't typically like painful and horrific. And so we tend to clean up the cross. Back at my home church in Sioux Falls, in the front of the sanctuary, we've got a gorgeous 
about 10, 12 foot cross. Handcrafted, handmade by one of our congregants, where it's got miters, 45s, uh, beautiful oak with a golden oak stain on it with several layers of finish, so it's flat smooth. But if we're being realistic, that's not at all what the cross was. The cross was an instrument of torture. Instead of imagining a beautiful cross, imagine a wooden beam so splintered that merely touching it could give you slivers. Now imagine a man's back that's flayed open due to a beating he took, grating up and against that wood as he tries to breathe. The cross was not beautiful golden oak stain. It was not wrought iron. The cross was an instrument of torture, soaked with blood and pieces of flesh. Horrific. And yet there's a beauty that comes out of that. There's a song I love by Jeremy Riddle called Sweetly Broken. The first verse of that song says, To the cross I look, to the cross I cling. Of its suffering I do drink, of its work I do sing. And I ask myself, how can, I, how can we embrace such a disgusting looking object of torture? How can we cling to it? How can we sing of praises of it? And I think the answer is this, is that there's a beauty that arises out of it because of what happened, because of what was accomplished through the work of the cross. Because God loved us when we were at our ugliest, scars and all, dots and all. He died for us in that moment. Because we have a God who has immense, tremendous, crazy love and compassion for us. That's why this woman was able to cling to his feet because of the beauty that she saw and the salvation and the healing that she so desired through Christ. And because he died, we have the opportunity to spend eternity with him. That is awesome. <laughs> Jesus took our scars. He came to earth, lived a perfect life, died, defeated death, and rose again, sits at God's right hand. Jesus Christ was perfect in every way except for one. And that one way is he had scars. If we read it in the book of John, Thomas talking to the disciples. He's risen, I've seen him. What's Thomas' response? Not until I touch his side, not until I touch his fingers. Am I put my fingers in his hands, am I going to believe it? And Jesus does what Jesus does. He calls him out on it. <laughs> Jesus shows up in their midst and says, Thomas, stick out your fingers and feel my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Jesus could have risen to his divine state of being, perfect in every way, but Jesus chose to keep the scars. And I believe he did so because his scars showed the greater story, glorified God, and showed what he did for us. And our scars can be used too. Scars aren't new, pain isn't new. In fact, I think God loves to use scarred people. Look through the Bible, they're everywhere. I mean, Adam had to live hundreds, hundreds of years knowing that he'd failed and sinned and got kicked out of the garden. Noah endured years of ridicule building a boat with this thing called rain that no one had ever seen before. Rahab was a prostitute. Um, Peter denied Christ. Mary had a child out of wedlock. And David, David was a lustful, scheming murderer who had a dysfunctional family. But the thing I think that all of them have in common is that they got caught up in a greater story. They trusted in the God and believed that God could use them, that God could use their shortcomings to point to Him and glorify Him. And I think when we come to our terms with our sin and our scars and put our faith in Christ, God wants to use us too. No matter what our past choices are, no matter how many scars we have, God loves us. And I think that when we point that to God, is that's the way he uses us. That's when beauty starts coming out of our scars. God draws us out of our ugliness into his kingdom. I've got a friend, used to be in sales, spent a lot of time on the road, and for whatever reason, struggled with alcohol and pornography. One night after drinking way too much, was on his way home, he got pulled over by a policeman. I don't know how he managed to do this, 
But he was able to make a deal with the police officer saying, if my wife is willing to come pick me up, would you let me off? Like I said, I don't know how he managed to do it, but the officer took him up on that. And his wife, whose marriage was already rocky because of his drinking, came and picked him up. And on the way home, as he sat there silently staring out the window into the night sky, it was the beginning of his redemption. It's the point in time where he's like, God, I can't do this anymore. Work in my life. And then God did. And man, my friend's a pastor now. And he's not proud of his scars. He's not proud of where he's been and what the things he had done. But at the same time, he's not ashamed of them either. Because God's using those to point people to Christ, to show, yeah, this is where I was. This is what I struggled with. This is how messed up I was. But I trusted in the God who loved me. Look what he's doing with me. Look at the life he's given me. God wants to use you too. God wants to heal you. There is no sin that we can have that is beyond God's ability. There's a reason they call him the great physician. It doesn't matter how much we tend to swear, how much we tend to drink, how much we doubt. It doesn't matter how many hurts we're carrying with us, what kind of past we have, or how much we're made fun of or ridiculed. God can take all that. God can heal us and give us a full life. And that's why I think there's beauty in our scars, is because we have a great God that draws us out of that and we can give glory to God through that. And he desires to give us a new heart. Turning to our Psalm 51 scripture, chapter, chapter 10, it says, Create me a new heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. I find it interesting that the, the Hebrew word for create is not a refashioning of the old. It's a brand new creative act that can only be performed by God. If we remember... David had an affair with Bathsheba. Tried to cover it up. Ended up having Uriah killed. <clears throat> and thought he was, he had handled it. And then Nathan the prophet shows up and he calls him out saying, you screwed up, buddy. And it's in this situation where, God, where David has repented hearts and humbled and knows he messed up. And he comes before God. And it's in this situation that he pens Psalm 51 asking for a clean heart. This is not a repatching up the old, a refashioning, it's a brand new creative act. Let me try to give you an illustration to demonstrate this. In high school, one Saturday I was heading into town for a junior high basketball tournament. I think I was going to work at it or watch it, I'm not sure. Driving my 1985 Buick diesel that I had gotten from my grandmother. The previous night, I'd broken up with my girlfriend. And when I say broken up, I mean dumped. Uh, <laughs> so I was distraught. The world was coming to an end. I start backing out of the garage in a state of mind. And I start turning so I could go down the driveway, not realizing that I'm still in the garage. And so I managed to rip off the front headlight assembly and part of the bumper. I get out of the car and look at the floor where there's pieces are all over, and I, I think to myself, my girlfriend dumped me. It's crazy cold outside. And my headlight's all over the garage. I could have done without that. But I pick up the pieces of this headlight and start putting them back in the, in the sock where they're supposed to go. And I did what any man with any amount of self-respect would do. I duct taped them. <laughs> and, and, and it worked, kind of, you know, in a, in a Marty Feldman kind of way. For those of you who are fans of Young Frankenstein and Igor, you get that analogy. The rest of you might have to go home and Wikipedia that. But the one headlight worked fine. The other one sort of was pointed off and up to the right, pretty much highlighting any second-story window of any house I drove by. <laughs> so what's the point? Is the point is that I refashioned that headlight and tried to make it work. But it was nothing like a brand-new headlight. God doesn't work with old. In fact, let me, let me show you this analogy. We all have heart that we're born with. And because we're born into sin, we're automatic, we automatically start with one scar. Throughout life, though, things we're told, things we do, choices we make, this heart ends up getting scarred. We, someone makes it fun of us. We sin against God. This, that, the other thing. People hurt us. We get, we get ripped up. 
And this is what we're left with when we come before the throne of God. I think sometimes we think, what's God do with this sinful, broken heart? I think we come into it thinking this is what God does. That he stitches it together, that he puts band-aids on it, and works with the remnants that we give him. Again, it does not refer to a refashioning of the old. A brand new heart. God is not in the, in the stitching world. God is in the heart transplant. Giving us brand new hearts. So what's, what do we do? When we give this new heart, when we fall at the feet of Christ, what do we do with that? Going back to the, the Luke passage. Jesus ends it by saying, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. I had a little research. I find it interesting the word go or the word peace. The Greek word for that refers to an untroubled, undisturbed well-being brought upon us by being reconciled to God. It means that we can walk away from where we've been undisturbed. We don't have to carry with us a backpack full of remorse, full of guilt, of shame, of scars. We've been reconciled with God. We've been brought back. We've been made new. The old is gone. The new has come. And yet, to be honest, we live in a fallen world. We're going to be given labels. We're going to be given dots. We're going to have our own troubles. We never hurts. And yet, this is the Easter season. And so this Easter season, we have a hope. We know that Christ died, defeated death, and rose again. And here's the thing. He's coming back. I don't know about you, but I'm excited. I'm ready for an upgrade. I'm, a, I'm in my mid-30s. I'm short. I'm overweight. I'm insecure. I'm ready for my new body. My wife's not going to complain. We will get to sit in God's presence for eternity, singing His praises. And the thought of that gives me hope. This woman encountered Christ, put her faith in Him, was given a clean heart. Her sins were forgiven. Her faith saved her soul in peace. He does the same thing for us. He forgives our sins. He gives us new hearts. He gives us hearts that are after God's own heart. And we can go in peace as well. And my prayer for you guys is that as we enter this Easter season is that we would think about that. That no matter what scars we're carrying with us, no matter what junk we have in our life, that we'd be willing to fall at Christ's feet and say, take this God, I need a new heart. I'm tired. I'm tired of the veneer. I'm tired of trying to hide behind it. Make me new. Like this woman, my prayer is that we'd be able to fall at Christ's feet. Embrace his scars. Cling to that cross despite how ugly it is. Allow ourselves to be wrapped up in a greater story. And when we do that, my prayer is that we have that same reaction that Thomas did. My Lord, my God. Pray with me. Father God, I thank you for this Sunday. I thank you for Easter where we can think back on the sacrifice that you made for us. Lord, I pray that you would help us to humble ourselves, to fall at your feet, to cling to your scars. That we would lay all of our hurts before you, all our dots. Help us to look to you, Father God. I pray that we would spend time with you, that you would Give us a new heart. Help us to shine your light to those around us. Help us to be wrapped up in this greater story of your salvation. That others would see us and say, you are not who you used to be. May we glorify you, Lord. And as we go from here, give us, I pray, a spirit that is untroubled, undisturbed, well-being. Amen.